Spagan annual conference, a virtual webinar, and uh, our next topic is uh, enteral nutrition in inflammatory bowel disease. And we have an eminent speaker, Professor Andrew Day from Kirst Church, New Zealand, who is going to talk on um, uh, this uh, specific topic. And uh, Professor Andrew Day is a consultant pediatric gastroenterologist based at Kirst uh, Church, New Zealand. He is providing clinical services across the the South Island of New Zealand. So, Professor of Pediatrics and Cure Kids Chair of Pediatrics Research in Christ Church. Uh, thanks, Professor Andrew Day, for accepting our invitation. Over to you now. Good evening. Thank you very much for the invitation. This evening, I'm going to present a recent case, talk a little bit about aspects of exclusive enteral nutrition as used for Crohn's disease and talk a little bit about the mechanisms of exclusive enteral nutrition, how this therapy might work. So onto a case. So this boy presented to us recently, he had a six week history of lethargy and substantial weight loss. He denied any diarrhea or hematochesia. His initial bloods on admission to hospital showed some marked changes in serum inflammatory markers and his calprotectin subsequently came back at over 800. He had an ultrasound on day two of admission that showed some ileal wall thickening. And with this information, we proceeded to a, a full endoscopic assessment. He had aphthoid ulcers in the antrum in the first part of the duodenum with patchy ulceration in the ileocecal region. Histologically, there was granulomatous ileitis with active and chronic inflammation in patches in the upper gut and in the cecum. He also went on to have an MR enterography and this showed 25 centimetres of ileal wall thickening with no other proximal small bowel disease and no extra intestinal changes noted. Following a discussion about Crohn's disease, the concepts of management and the general aspects of pathogenesis with him and his family, we recommend a commencement of exclusive enteral nutrition. And um, he started this a day or two later. He um, had a selection of um, formulas that he tasted and he chose a variety of flavors of Fortisip. Um, by day three, he progressed to having the full volume that we'd recommended, eight drinks a day, um, having slowly phased in in terms of a couple the first day, three or four the next day, building up to eight on day three. <clears throat> also commenced him on a meprazole, 20 milligrams once daily, in view of his gastric involvement, um, as I find this can help with adherence and ex, um, initial tolerance of the formula. Two weeks later, his inflammatory markers had improved nicely. He had gained more than a kilogram and he was feeling better. We reviewed him two weekly over the following weeks. He was adherent to his therapy with no concerns. He was gaining weight and he was feeling great um, with no other concerns noted. At the end of eight weeks of exclusive enteral nutrition, he denied any symptoms at all. He was feeling great. He was back to school and full normal activities. His inflammatory markers had largely normalized with calprotectin coming down to below 200. He'd gained more than three kilograms over that eight weeks. And the next steps were, re were phased recommencement of normal diet with a progressive increase in volume uh, in the number of meals and the complexity of the foods whilst reducing the volume of um, enteral formula. <clears throat> We'd recommended ongoing maintenance enteral nutrition. My usual practice is two or three drinks a day in addition to normal food. Uh, and subsequently, four weeks following the reintroduction of normal diet, he continued to do well. His calprotectin was actually down further at just over 100. And his review and monitoring is ongoing. <clears throat> so exclusive enteral nutrition seems to help. <clears throat> Clearly, EEN has been something that's been around for a long time. The initial reports in the late 70s 
case reports and small case series that documented um, improvement in symptoms. And some of those initial reports included adults that were preparing for operations, had a period of nutritional support um, with big improvements. The first controlled study was in the early 80s in Ireland and adults comparing corticosteroids to an elemental formula with similar results noted for both treatments. Subsequently, many studies have shown that polymeric formulas are just as effective as semi-elemental or elemental formulas with vastly um, superior taste characteristics with improved adherence as a consequence. Furthermore, many studies have shown that EEN is equivalent, if not better, to steroids, and this is a, um, a, systemic re a systematic review from some time ago with other data subsequent to that showing similar results. And now, <clears throat> Um, internationally as per the ECHO and ESPRGAN criteria and uh, closer to home in terms of the New Zealand guidelines, EEN is recommended as the first line treatment to induce remission in those children presenting with acute luminal Crohn's disease and may have a role in non-luminal Crohn's disease such as fistulizing um, and perioral Crohn's disease as well. Summarizing data, EN induces remission in the majority of children, at least 80%, in our hands sort of 85 to 90%, probably doesn't work as well in a child that has long-standing or no Crohn's disease. And as well as improving disease activity, certainly enhances nutrition. And even in those that don't enter remission, Typically, there would be improvement in markers of disease activity and nutrition. Although it's controversial, my feeling is that disease location does not relate to outcome, and I would certainly use EEN even in the context of pancolonic Crohn's disease. Our standard protocol is using a, a polymeric formula, Ensure or Fortisip as an example, um, for eight weeks with over this time, the formula being the exclusive nutritional intake. We permit children to have extra water. In fact, we encourage that, particularly in summer. And we encourage small amounts of sugarless chewing gum to encourage sugar, to encourage, encourage chewing action. <clears throat> um, we base the volume on uh, estimated energy requirements using the Schofield equation. And we review children regularly with two weekly review in clinic as well as frequent email or phone contact in the interim. If children have not gained weight, we would adjust the intake um, accordingly. Most of the children in our hands would take the formula orally. Only a small number may need extra assistance, such as with a nasogastric tube. Certainly multidisciplinary support um, is we and you work very hard with our dietitian and nursing staff in terms of the ongoing support, even between clinic visits. <clears throat> Some of the factors influencing the success of exclusive venture nutrition in children um, are listed here. Positive messaging, I think, is very important, including um, what the parents say to the child right from the beginning as well. So a mother recently who said, oh, no, I'm not sure my daughter can actually do this um, is something that we would actively discourage. <clears throat> Getting the whole family involved, I often encourage um, other members of the family to give up things during this eight week period, emphasizing to the child that this is a treatment. This is not just fancy milkshakes. This is the treatment to induce remission. As mentioned already, close dis multidisciplinary support is very important. Regular review and encouragement and um, uh, emphasizing um, the, um, the benefits and the progress of the child is also very important. What might be some of the outcomes? And there's lots of data showing improved disease activity as per this graph, showing a reduction in um, um, pediatric Crohn's disease activity index with many, much of those changes happening early in the first two to four weeks. Mucosal healing um, is also 
um, clearly illustrated or seen following exclusive veterinary nutrition, and this is just one of the several studies. In this study, repeat endoscopic assessment at 10 weeks showed that three quarters of the group that had been treated with EN had mucosal healing, compared to only a third of those treated with corticosteroids over the same duration. And probably the um, TNF inhibitors and exclusive venture nutrition are the two therapies that we can offer children that lead to similarly high rates of mucosal healing. <clears throat> what might be some of the longer term outcomes? This is a small report from um, uh, one of my, my reports. Um, so children that have been treated initially with EEN or corticosteroids and followed up for the following 24 months. Those children that had EEN had a lower disease activity index at six months. They'd had a significantly lower um, exposure to steroids over the first 24 months. Uh, and uh, the experience that children treated with steroids initially may well subsequently be treated again with steroids. <clears throat> and these children treated with EEN also had better height gains over those first two years which may reflect their reduced steroid exposure as well. These children treated with EEN also had some protection from relapse over this 24 months. Um, wasn't, um, uh, this is a, a survival curve analysis with the dashed lines being those that were treated with steroids and the solid lines being those treated with EEN initially. And clearly these children went on to maintenance therapies as well, but their initial um, improvements with EN seem to have an ongoing impact. More recent study, this is a European study, the Growth CD, um, and they showed similarly that height gains were superior over the, subs over the first year or two. Um, they also showed a significant difference in the um, initial induction of remission. <clears throat> Uh, both in terms on, on the left-hand side in terms of the overall remission rate and on the, as included in this purple circle, the propensity um, matching, showing a big difference in the um, induction, induction of remission in the first weeks. EEM also clearly improves nutrition. Weight gains are typical. And furthermore, I would be concerned if a child was losing weight during EEN um, and I would optimize their intake and expect, if not demand, weight gains. <clears throat> some of the nutritional improvements occur rapidly. Some of these are mediated through proteins such as IGF-1. And just to illustrate this, this is some data of a small number of um, children, um, their initial IGF-1 was low. By two weeks, the IGF-1 had increased substantially and that was maintained over the subsequent weeks of their course of exclusive entry nutrition. Bone health, bone turnover is also improved with exclusive entry nutrition. <clears throat> In this group of 23 children, we looked at markers of bone turnover so cross laps um, reflecting bone resorption and bone specific alkaline phosphatase reflecting um, bone formation. And this was compared to control data. Um, serum cross laps reflecting breakdown of bone was substantially higher than the, in the children with IBD than controls and improved over the eight weeks of a period of exclusive entry nutrition to control values and the um, BSALP did the reverse. It also normalized back to control values with reflection of new bone formation over that eight weeks. And there's some other data, including um, from North America and from Europe, um, looking at other aspects of bone health, um, again, illustrating that a period of exclusive entry nutrition improves not just markers of bone turnover, but also reflecting and bone, bone mineral density. In this report from last year, small number of children compared to controls, their bone mineral density was lower than controls um, and improved in the first year following treatment. 
So in summary, exclusive entry nutrition clearly has a role in induction of remission in children with Crohn's disease. Some of the benefits include steroid sparing activity, enhanced bone health, high rates of mucosal healing, and significant improvements in nutrition, both in terms of um, overall weight gains, but also in terms of micronutrient status as well. <clears throat> so how could a polymeric formula or even an elemental formula do this? And clearly trying to understand and define the mechanisms of exclusive entry nutrition is important in a number of different reasons. And I've just listed three here. This first of all may permit optimization of therapy. If we understand how it works, we may be able to um, optimize it further, such as combining exclusive entry nutrition with another nutritional intervention or with a medical therapy. Um, we may also be able to optimize the use of exclusive entry nutrition across populations <clears throat> by encouraging centers that um, have hesitation. Um, if we can establish more clearly that this is actually doing what we think it's doing, um, maybe we can enhance the overall use of this treatment. And furthermore, this may help us to understand the underlying mechanisms of pathogenesis of um, Crohn's disease as well. <clears throat> Some of the putative mechanisms include direct anti-inflammatory effects, alteriza alteration of the microbiota, effects on barrier function, and innate responses. Um, and some of our work has touched on all of these in the, um, in the pursuit of uh, time today. I'm just going to focus on some of these, uh, a couple of these aspects, not all of them. <clears throat> so in terms of antibacterial proteins, um, innate defense, uh, we've done some work looking at uh, intestinal alkaline phosphatase and CCAM6. <clears throat> and I'll just illustrate some of this data. So alkaline phosphatase, as I'm sure you're aware, has a number of roles in terms of um, having in, in terms of innate defense. It has some direct antibacterial effects, but also effects upon bacterial products such as LPS um, following secretion from the epithelium, and then interacts also with other aspects of innate of um, immune response. So we've shown using an in vitro model of gut inflammation, so epithelial cells triggered with um, pro-inflammatory pro cytokines and rescued or treated with polymeric formula. Um, and PEF is the abbreviation I've used for some of, this, for some of these slides. <clears throat> First of all, these epithelial cells um, uh, exposed to polymeric formula make much more intestinal um, alkaline phosphatase than control cells that are untreated. Just to illustrate this further in, um, in immunofluorescent um, method, um, this is control cells over that time period and progressive increases in the concentration of um, polymeric formula exposed to these cells. <clears throat> Um, showing a dose-dependent increase in the um, production of alkaline phosphatase. Two minutes to go, thank you. Um, in CCAM6, so this is a member of a family of cell adhesion molecules, um, just to illustrate the family members on this slide. <clears throat> and we've shown that polymeric formula increases the production of CCAM6 in a dose-dependent fashion, as illustrated on the top produces a um, similar amount of protein, of CCAM6 protein, compared to a um, positive control interferon gamma, and furthermore increases the um, uh, three, or three to four-fold increase in the mRNA response in CCAM6, again, similar to interferon gamma. <clears throat> to illustrate this um, in a qualitative fashion, so this is the control cells, in the green is the CCAM6 that's co-stained. And again, in a dose-dependent fashion, we're able to illustrate that there's a substantial increase in the CCAM6 produced. What might, might this be doing? Um, we've illustrated this in terms of adherent invasive E. coli. 
Um, first of all, as we increase the polymeric formula, we're getting increased absorbance as the secam 6 binds to the bacteria in, in the extracellular region of, these, of this model. And furthermore, we can show that the amount of e, of e. coli that invades the cells decreases again in a dose-dependent fashion. <clears throat> so both of these proteins, but CCAM6 in particular, and probably acts as a decoy receptor that's triggered by polymeric formula being secreted by the epithelium into the lumen, binding bacteria or and or bacterial products and preventing interaction with the epithelium. Um, <clears throat> and moving on to permeability as one aspect of barrier function. As I'm sure you are aware, there's changes in permeability that occur in IBD. <clears throat> We've shown again using an in vitro model that TNF increases the short circuit current, and this is rescued by exposure of these cells to polymeric formula, as illustrated in this graph. <clears throat> and if we look at this, the um, tight junction proteins, um, we can show in the control cells that they're along the cell borders. We can disrupt that with TNF in the middle sections, and then we can rescue that with polymeric formula, showing that the protein returns to, this, to the cell junctions where it's meant to be. <clears throat> um, and other aspects of this have also been illustrated in terms of looking at the mRNA responses and HRP flux. <clears throat> And moving from that in vitro setting in an animal model of colitis triggered by infection, um, we showed that TER and short circuit current are altered in the um, setting of colitis and then rescued with exposure of these animals to a period of exclusive intranutrition. So EEN has many key roles in the setting of inflammatory bowel disease, in particular Crohn's disease, with a number of mechanisms, and I've just illustrated some of these. Um, and although we know some about exclusive entry nutrition, there are still many answers yet to follow. I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Many thanks, sir. Uh, 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 fantastic talk and sharing all your wonderful research.